The Watsons Go to Birmingham, Chapter 14. Every bird and bug in Birmingham stops and wonders. I know it was Sunday because I heard Joetta getting ready for Sunday school. The neighbors came and got her as soon as I got out of bed. I was standing in the doorway of the bedroom doing my morning scratches when she walked by. Hi, Kenny. See you later. Bye, Joey. She had on a fluffy white skirt, a regular blouse, and the little white gloves Grandma Sands had made her. I don't know why, but I said, Joey. She stopped. Huh? I couldn't think why I called her names. So I just kind of threw out. You look real pretty. She smiled and thanked me. She did look kind of pretty, too. She had on a lacy white hat and little lacy white socks and her shiny, shiny black shoes. The people that came to get her saw me, and one of them said, How come you ain't going to Sunday school, young man? I smiled and said, I forgot to get up in time. Everybody in the house knew that was a lie, but no one seemed to care. I wondered if there was something wrong with me, because it was real easy for me to lie, even to a pack of religious people on Sunday morning. I had my cereal and went out into the backyard. It was too hot even this early in the morning. So I walked over to the giant magnolia tree and rested in the coolness of its shade. All the energy was gone from me already. It had been a few days since I almost got snatched by the wool poo, and I still felt weak and tired all the time. Byron had made me promise not to tell anyone what had happened, so everybody thought I was just being lazy. I heard people waking up and moving around inside, but I was feeling too tired to go and speak to anyone. Mama stuck her head out of the back door and got ready to yell for me. When she saw me plop down at the foot of the tree, she smiled. Well, Kenneth, I thought you wandered off. How are you this morning? It was too hot to sleep. Think you can last one more week? Uh Uh-huh. Well, isn't this better than winter up north? Quit teasing, Mama. You know it isn't. I wish I was back in our igloo in Flint. She laughed and the screen door closed behind her. I I started going to sleep under the tree and I thought I was dreaming when the noise came. I felt it more than heard it. The giant old magnolia tree shook one time like something had given it a hard snatch by the roots. Then there was a sound like a far off thunderstorm coming, except it only thundered one long time. It seemed like every animal and bird and bug in Birmingham stopped making noise for about two seconds. It seemed like everything that was alive stopped whatever it was doing and was wondering the same thing. What was that noise? Doors opened in the neighborhood and people came out and looked up in the sky, but there was nothing there. Not one cloud, nothing to give a clue to what the big hollow sound was. Nothing but bright, hot, stupid Alabama sun. Dad came to the back door in pajama pants and a t-shirt. What was that? Was that back there? I shook my head. He looked like a bell went off in his head and said, oh Lord, where's Byron? Byron poked his head out of the door, still in his underpants and still doing his morning scratches. What? He said. I didn't do nothing. I was asleep. What was that bang? Dad kept looking toward the sky and said, Hmm, must have been a sonic boom. He closed the screen door. If this had happened in Flint, I would have investigated to find out what it was. That horrible sun had sucked all the curiosity out of me. I leaned back against the tree and closed my eyes. I don't know if I got to sleep or not, but Mama's scream made me jump nearly to the magnolia's top branch. I'd never heard Mama's voice sound so bad. I felt like I did that time I stuck a bobby pin in a wall socket. I ran to the door and into the house, and Bai almost knocked me over running back toward the bedroom. What's wrong with Mama? I asked. I looked in the living room, but Mom and Dad weren't there. I ran back to the bedroom where Byron was trying to wrestle into a pair of pants. Bai, what happened? He got the pants up and said, A guy just came by and said something, somebody dropped a bomb on Joey's church. And he was gone, exploding out the front door, trying to zip up his pants at the same time he ran off the porch. Some of the time I wondered if something really was wrong with me. Byron had just told me that someone had dropped a bomb on Joey's church, hadn't he? If that was true, why did I just stand there looking stupid? If that was true, why was I only thinking about how much trouble Byron was going to be in when they heard how loud he'd slammed the screen door? And asking myself, why hadn't he put on his shoes? His socks wouldn't last two minutes on the Alabama mud. I ran onto the porch and ran into the street. It looked like someone had set off a a people magnet. It seemed like everyone in Birmingham was running down the street. It looked like a river of scared brown bodies was being jerked in the same direction that Bai had gone. So I followed.
I guess my ears couldn't take it, so they just stopped listening. I could see people everywhere making their mouths go like they were screaming and pointing and yelling, but I didn't hear anything. I saw mom and dad and Byron holding on to each other, all three of them looking like they were crazy and trying to keep each other from the pile of rocks that used to be the front of the church. Mama was so upset, she even forgot to cover the space in her front teeth. I couldn't hear her, but I bet a million dollars she was shouting, why? Over and over like a real nut. It looked like dad's mouth was yelling, Joanna! I was kind of surprised no adult stopped me from walking right up to the church. That right next to where the door used to be when the guy came out with the little girl in her arms. He had on the same thing dad did, a t-shirt and pajama pants, but it looked like he'd been painting with red, red paint. The little girl had on a blue dress and little blue frilly socks and black shiny, shiny shoes. I looked into the church and saw smoke and dust flying around like a tornado was in there. One light from the ceiling was still hanging down by a wire, flickering and swinging back and forth, and every once in a while I could see stuff inside. I could see a couple of grown-ups moving around looking lost, trying to pick things up. Then the smoke would cover them, and then the bulb would flicker out and they'd disappear. I could see Bibles and coloring books thrown all over the place. Then they'd get covered by the smoke. I could see a shiny, shiny black shoe lying halfway underneath some concrete. Then it got covered in smoke. And then the light bulb flickered out again. I bent down to pull the shoe from under the concrete and tugged and pulled at it, but it felt like something was pulling it back. All the hair in my head jumped to attention. The light flickered back on and the smoke cleared, and I could see that hanging onto the other end of the shoe was a giant gray hand with cold, hard, square fingers. Oh, oh, I looked up and I saw a familiar guy, and before he got covered with smoke, he looked at me, and I saw he had big square shoulders and nothing where his face should have been. The wool poo. Oh, man, I gave the shoe one more hard tug, and it popped loose from a frilly white sock. I got real scared. I walked as slowly and as quietly as I could out of the church. Maybe if I moved quietly, he wouldn't come for me. Maybe if I walked and didn't look back, he'd leave me alone. I walked past where the adults were still screaming and pointing. I walked past where that guy had set the little girl in blue right next to where someone had else had seen the little girl in red. I know if Joey sat down next to those two, their dresses would make the red, white, and blue of the American flag. Grown-ups were kneeling down by them, and the adults' hands fluttered down toward the little girls. Then before they touched anything, fluttered back up over and over. Their hands looked like a little flock of brown sparrows that were too nervous to land. I walked past people lying around in little balls on the grass, crying and twitching. I walked past people squeezing each other and shaking. I walked past people hugging trees and telephone poles, looking like they were afraid they might fly off the earth if they let go. I walked past a million people with their mouths wide open and no sounds coming out. I didn't look behind me and walked back as quick as I could to Grandma Sands' house. I felt like I floated up the front stairs. Then I made sure the screen door didn't slam and took my shoes off and went in and sat on my bed. I hadn't remembered to make it that morning, so I got up and tucked the sheets in and fluffed up the pillow like Mama does. I sat back on the bed and looked down at my hands. They were acting like nervous little sparrows, too, so I squeezed them behind my knees, between my knees. I reached in my pocket and took out the shiny, shiny shoe. When me and the wool poo were trying to grab it away from each other and the back part had got ripped, man, the shoe was ripped like it was made out of paper. The picture of the little white boy with the, cur with the girl's hairdo and the dog was torn right in half. All that was left was the dog smiling at me like he'd just eaten a cat. I tried to remember if I'd been mean to Joey this morning. I guess I hadn't. I never did tell her how she helped Byron save my life in the water. I guess I should have. Where'd you go? How'd you get back so fast? How come you changed your clothes? My ears had decided to work again. I looked up towards the door, but stopped looking when I saw the white, white frilly socks standing on the wooden floor in front of my door. I guess the wool pole was taking Joey around for her last visit. I was afraid to look up. I was afraid to look at her face. I knew I'd see the wool pulls rope tied around her waist. Hi, Joey, was all I could think of saying. Where's mama and daddy? Oh, you'll probably get to see them next. He takes you around to see your family before you go. She sat beside me on the bed. I still wouldn't look at her. 
I drop the shoe and use my knees to stop the sparrows from fluttering around. Oh man, this was very scary. I'd seen the two little girls in the grass in the red and blue dresses and I didn't want to see my little sister that way too. What's wrong with you, Kenny? How come you're, you're looking so funny? I guess I should have told you thanks for saving my life, huh? Is it too late to tell you that? No, he didn't say anything for a second. Then got up off the bed. Why are you acting so crazy? Where are mommy and daddy? What's that you dropped? What are you trying to hide? She picked up her she picked her shoe up from where I dropped it. Oh, Kenny, whose shoe is this? What did you do to it? It's yours, Joey. I got it from the wool poo. You better quit trying to scare me, Kenny, or I'm going to tell Mama. This better not be my shoe or you're in big trouble, Buster. Joey walked out of the room, but I still couldn't look at her. The wool poo was pull, whoosh, stopping her away. Joey? After a second, she came back into my bedroom. What? She was sounding real, real mean. I didn't look up. I kept looking at my hands. I love you. Oof. That shiny, shiny, ripped black shoe hit me right in the test, chest. Whose shoe was that? I finally looked up to see what Joey looked like. There were no ropes around her waist and nobody with square toes was hanging around. But re what really surprised me was that Joey had both of her shiny, shiny black shoes in her hands. She'd taken them off at the front door. Kenneth Bernard Watson, you better tell me what's going on or I'm really going to tell. I'm not playing with you. Joey was imitating some mama so much that she... Didn't say Bernard, she said Bernard. Joey, didn't you go to Sunday school? You know I did. Don't you know what happened? Joey sat back down next to me. Kenny, I'm not playing with you. Why are you acting so weird? Her voice was starting to get all choky. Why aren't you still in that church? It was so hot in there that I went and stood on the porch and saw you. Saw me? Where? Kenny, you better stop this nonsense. You know you waved at me from across the street. You know, when I tried to come to you, you kept laughing and running in front of me. You know, I chased you all the way down the street. Joey got a funny look on her face. But you had on different clothes. Joey's voice was getting higher with everything she said. When she was done, she was sounding real crazy. Joey, I... That's it. You're through this time, mister. You don't know when to stop teasing, do you? That's it, I'm telling on you. Joey stood up and ran up the stairs screaming. Mommy, mommy, mommy. I could hear Grandma Sands moving around upstairs, and she finally clomped down the steps and came into my room. Joey was hanging on her arms, on her arms, still screaming. Grandma Sands must have real thin blood, because even though it was as hot as a furnace in the house, she had on a big, thick nightgown and a big, thick robe. The smell of baby powder came into the room a second after she did. What on earth are y'all doing raising this much cane this early in the morning? Joetta, honey, stop that noise. Kenny, what's going on with this child? Joetta finally said, He's trying to scare me, Grandma Sands. He won't come where Mommy is. Joey kept boo-hooing like a real idiot. Kenneth, where's Walona and Daniel? Grandma Sands pulled Joey off her leg and held her shoulders and gave her a little shake. Joetta, you stop that noise. Grandma Sands can't handle that much noise. It's early, sweetheart. A bell went off in my head. The wool poo had missed Joey. He wasn't having much luck with all of these weird Watsons. I had to go to the church to get Mama and Dad and Byron. Grandma Sands said, What are all them sirens doing? Lord, has the world gone mad today? Where's your Mom and Daddy? The last thing I heard was Grandma Sands yelling, Boy, if you slam that door like that again, I looked down and saw my socks flying over the Alabama mud.